Yes, we are live. We are live. Here we go. The Reentry Connect podcast. Yes, with the next level living with my guest today, Mr. Chris Smith. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. We are here. Listen, I'm telling you, y'all in for a treat. We have a motivational speaker, a recovery coach, a health and wellness advocate, accountability partner, all the above. And his accolades are are, are not just talked about. Like, he actually lives this stuff. I'm here, you know, like, really, it's a privilege to really have him on this live because I know that from his story, you know, you wouldn't even, just by looking at him, you wouldn't even know that he's been through the things that he's been through. So, I know, um, again, this podcast is is to bring awareness, is to make people be um, uh, encouraged, mm-hmm. you know, despite what you may have been through, despite what they may have said about you in the past, despite of what prison cell you may have been in, there's mm-hmm. still hope at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. So, again, it's your host, Keenan Hudson, here with the Reentry Connect podcast, hey, and Mr. <laughs> Smith, Mr. Chris Smith. If you could go ahead, just give yourself a little introduction, man, and really tell the people, man, your journey, uh-huh. what you've been through in life, man, and what you're doing now. Because I know it's powerful. I already know. You already know I know. But, man, Come on, man. Hey, without Come on. further ado. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Look, how much time we got, Mr. Keenan? Oh, how much man. time we got? Man, man. Just, just go until <laughs> so we can't yeah, go yeah. no more, man. Well, listen, man, hey, thank you, first of all, for having me on, my man. Look, grateful for the work that you're doing, man, being a voice in your community, man. Look, and you're making an impact. You're making an impact and influence and others to do the same. So thank you, man. I watched you from afar, and I'm grateful now that we've got to connect. Man, so big ups to you and all that you do, man. You know, again, my name's Chris Smith. And I live uh, I live in Tennessee, man. I'm a 44-year-old young man. Come on, man. I'll run circles around them boys. I'm 20 years old. I'm just saying, man. I'm just saying. Got to keep it tight. But, it, you know, and and I, I haven't been too many places. I've always been kind of stuck in a rural area. I've, I've, I've left and always come back. Um, you know, it seems like it's always start over after start over. Born... Born in a rural area, some people would say that um, I was born on the other side of town, you know what I mean, across the tracks. We grew up uh, we grew up in a poverty-stricken area, man, you know, um, and I, I tell people all the time, man, we so poor, bro. We were so poor that there was... I, and I showed people where we grew up at. I went back to the place. I showed people on LinkedIn, man. You can catch it about a couple months back. But um, there was five of us in the house, and we lived in a one-room apartment. And we had one bed, yeah, so so we would share. Sometimes, you know, uh, we would take turns and get into sleep in the bed. So I tell people all the time, you know, I, I never got up and made the bed. Your boy got up and made the floor. You know what I'm saying? Like we got up and made the floor, yeah. and uh, we didn't have bowls. You know, you know, you when you had that uh the Cool Whip, the Cool yeah. Whip container, and uh-huh. that's what we eat out of. It had the orange ring around it. <laughs> you know? Do you remember that? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Right. Had the that's orange good. ring around it, man. Yeah, from, yeah, from, uh, yeah man. So uh-huh. you know that that was our utensils. That was our that was our dishes. You know, but. Yeah, and so uh, the place that we grew up to, uh, like I said, very, uh, very poor, rough environment, uh, uh, a lot of dysfunction in my family. My father left at, when I was uh, four years old, and my mother remarried, and um, that's where we were at in that um, dysfunction, exposed to drugs and violence growing up, even even in my environment, you know. And so when we went outside. When we went outside, you know, to play, man, our plan was throwing rocks and, and getting in fights. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, uh, and that was it. Like, that was it. And, you know, and that's how that's how we played. Uh, really rough. Brought up real rough. Brought up to be tough. You, know, you had to be. Man, you had to be. 
Um, so anyways, um, I got in a lot of trouble when I was a kid, you know what I mean? Just got in a lot of trouble, end up, um, I'll fast forward, uh, Nine years old, took my first drink. Eleven years old, snorted my first line of cocaine. My stepfather, my stepfather's, one of his closest friends, uh, called me into the bathroom one one day. And um, he was like, let me show you. He was like, you know what this is? I was like, no. Uh -uh. He said, it's cocaine. You know, he said, let me show you how to do it. So he rolled up at Dollar Bill, hit that line, gave it to me. I did the same thing. First time. Oh, yeah. F hey, flight. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You know, flight. Took it. Took me away. Took me away for a moment. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Your boy didn't like being there. Your boy didn't like being in that, in that environment. We had to do what we had to do, even as a young kid, you know. But even the kid knows that this ain't right. You know what I mean? And uh, it took me away for a moment. But anyways, that right there began um, uh, began a life that early of drug use, you know, partying. I got sent off when I was uh, about to turn 15. I got sent off to a juvie uh, facility, Taft. They're closed down now. And let me tell you something, man. That place was rough, bro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that place was rough, man. Let me. And I've, I've been to prison twice. All right. I've been to prison twice, but, but juvie roughest place I ever been mm. roughest place I ever been, man. I've never seen anything like it, but anyways, um, you know, got out. Um, I got out, um, at 17 and, uh, I turned 18 September 98, Man, December of 1998, I was introduced to methamphetamine, and I found the love of my life. Love of my life. Crystal. Called her Crystal. Man. Man, she was mean to me, but I never left her side. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and so my very first time, bro, my very first time that I used Crystal meth was, uh, uh, was my first charge. Was my first charge. Like I said, we lived in a rural area. Wasn't nothing to do except get into mischief, find a little trouble. Mm -hmm. So we broke into a bunch of different places. Ended up getting caught, man. End up getting, yeah, end up getting caught and uh, getting my first little bid. And, uh, yeah. And here's the thing about that, though. You know, you think that, uh, you would think that, when trouble happens and you're in the middle of trouble and you see the severity of your actions wow. that it would make you think like, man, this isn't a good road to go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's what happened, Keenan. Here's what happened when, when I went into that jail, when I had my bag, you know what I'm saying? My little laundry bag, I had my bed. You know, and my and my stuff, and they walked me down that. They walked me through the gate. And walked me down that that little. It was on this. We called it East Side. We walked down East Side into the single cell population, and I hear my name. Everybody called me Smitty. I hear my name, Smitty, Smitty, Smitty. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, and I'm like, you good? You good? Okay. Yeah. And I'm like, um, man, this is where everybody at. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is where all my friends are. So it felt like home. Oh. It felt like home mm -hmm. where the place that I lived, the environment that I lived, the, the environment that I came from, that's where yeah. everybody was at. Wow. So look, we were just doing our time, buying our time. And so, and so here, right. So here I was like, oh man, you know, we do. For, and, I, and I got four months, right? I got four months. They gave me a little two year sentence. I got four months, a little slap on the wrist. They didn't care. You know, that two years turned into five, Keenan. Let me tell you, I swear it did. Look, caught another charge. They put a little stack sentence on that. Wow. And they sent me to prison, 20 years old. I'm in prison. So. So I'm in prison at 20, scared to death. I go in there. Who do I see? Who do you see? 
Man, everybody I know. Wow, yeah. <laughs> everybody I know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, hey. So it was it was like a it was like a uh uh what do they call that? A family uh uh uh-huh. reunion. It was like oh, a yeah. fa- <laughs> it was like a family reunion, man. Oh. Man just took me under the wing. I was like, man, this ain't so bad. This ain't so bad. And I can listen, man. I, and if I can be just completely honest with you, man, mm-hmm. if I can be completely honest with you, I loved it. Wow. I love it. You want me to tell you why, though? Why? Because I really didn't have no family. I really didn't have no, I didn't, I really didn't have any family out there. I really didn't have anybody to hang out with out there. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't have anybody. And so I knew that when I went in there, they wasn't going nowhere. They were going to be there. I was going to be there. And this is what's sad, man. At an early age, right? At an early age, I knew that if I stayed in this lifestyle, that these were going to be the consequences of my actions. These mm-hmm. were going to be the consequences of my actions, right? Mm-hmm. So I accepted them. I accepted them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. accept them. Because here's the thing I've never seen anybody from where I'm from make it out. Mm-hmm. So there's no sense in me f- trying to fight my way out of something that I've never seen anybody else make it out of. For what? For what? what? So this is it. (laughs) And so, and of course, my disease progressed, my addiction, right? My my addiction progressed. And so, and here's the thing. I was locked up so much in and out, and they would send me off to these treatment centers and everything. and, And here's the thing. I could live within the confines of those facilities because I knew what to expect from people and I knew who they were. I knew the people because that's who I was. I didn't know these people out here in this world and I developed a disorder. They diagnosed me with social anxiety disorder. Sad, if you will, for sure. Sad. And it is sad. It is sad. And because I didn't trust anybody. I didn't like the way that they looked at me. I didn't like that I didn't have opportunity, even if, right? Because I would get out. I would get out and I would want to try to like maybe catch a job. Yeah, maybe try to be productive. Mm-hmm. But I never had a shot, like a real shot shot. Wow. Just a real shot, you know, and so I was like, man, screw it. I'm just going to keep doing what I do. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to keep doing what I do. And again, this is how my my addiction progressed. Okay. My addiction progressed from that two-year sentence to that three-year sentence to that five-year sentence wow. to, that, to an eight-year sentence. And now currently I'm on a 16, right? I got nine years left on paper. Now I've been out, you know, I've been out what uh boy how time flies. I've been out uh so I've been out seven years. Been out seven, I've been out seven. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. But and and here's the thing, and let me fast forward. So I'm gonna fast forward. Yeah. A lot of in between all that and me trying to fight, thinking that maybe Maybe I'm fooling myself thinking that this is all life has to offer me. So I'm going to give it a shot. And then I fail. Give it a shot. Then I fail. Give it a shot. Then I fail. Right. To where I'm just discouraged and I want to give up. Right. Mm -hmm. To where I've got suicidal ideation diagnosed with a mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. Confused about confused, disgruntled, angry, uh, hate my heart about why the community has this perception of me. Cause really I am a good guy. I promise you deep down inside, mm-hmm. but everybody wants to see the bad. And if they want to see the bad, what Scarface say, he said, 
he he said he said say good night to the bad guy because this is the last time you're going to see a bad guy look this good so he chose to be bad so i made a decision if th if, if this is the way that you're going to perceive me uh -huh. man then i'm going to be that guy you're going to be that guy i'm going to be that guy man yeah, yeah, i'm going to yeah. be that guy yeah 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 and so i carried that i carried that uh -huh. this last time keenan so I'll get to this piece right here. I'll okay. get to this piece. This last time when I was fighting this case, right? And my wife, she's in the other room. My wife had never been in trouble before. And mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm fixed to go off on a, I'm go, about to go off on a tangent real quick. My wife was a scrub in, in the OR operating room with the doctors, had a great job, never been in trouble in her life. Okay. Got up with your boy. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I made a, I had a, this great idea that we were going to sell drugs. I've never really been a drug dealer, but I never mm -hmm. really, I was just a little petty nickel and dime pusher. You know what I mean? I was always like the middleman and yeah. I was really the last person you wanted to call because I was going to make 10 off of you, but I was going to pinch the bag too. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, oh, yeah, man. you didn't want to call me, bro. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah. I knew everybody, I knew everybody, I knew who was holding. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. But anyways, uh, so I decided I was going to give it a shot. Okay. And I got up with her and, you know, in what, 10 months time, her and myself are in drug distribution where we're distributing drugs in parts of four states. Wow. Yeah. Running, making $25,000, $30,000 a year. And so... Anyways, and look, hey guys, don't take my word for it. Hop on Just Deal Law. They make case law out of it. Hop mm -hmm. on Just Deal Law. Look me up. Yeah. yeah. But anyways, we got we got caught. We got in trouble, right? Mm. What happens? She, she got in trouble too. She got in trouble too. She lost her license. Wow, lost the license. She lost her license. Sure. Can't work in a work in a hospital. Isn't that something though? Wow. First time she ever been in trouble. Can't work in a hospital anymore. She walked her little eight year sentence down though. She's off paper now and everything. We're trying to see if if there is some way that we can maneuver back into. Hard, yeah. You can definitely yeah get yeah hard with things like that. Yeah yeah. yeah. And just yeah. real quick, Mister Chris, I just want to yeah. just backtrack this a little bit. Yeah, please. So, You've been through the prisons. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been through a lot of trouble. Not mm -hmm. once, not twice, three times. You mm -hmm. had your first drink. You had your snort of coke. You mm -hmm. had all these things. So it took several times mm -hmm. for you to go through what you went through mm -hmm. for you to bump your head and get it right. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. So now, at what moment did you have that life-changing experience mm. that set you straight to get you on the path that you're on now? So it was a, I was sitting in, I was, I was sitting in my cell on my bed, on my bunk, right? Mm -hmm. Watching TV. And a fella that I was very familiar with came into my cell sat on the bunk. We sat there for a minute and I knew he wanted to talk about something, you know, I knew he did. Yeah. Yeah. So Keenan, man, he, he turned to look at me. He was like, Smitty, man. I was like, what's up, bro? He's like, man, I'm going to change my life. I looked at him and I laughed. I laughed at him, bro. Cause I'm thinking, Man, don't you get it? This is it, bro. Man, settle in. This is it. You're going to try to change your life and have this life taken away from you right here and fail, and you're left with nothing. nothing. For me, I was thinking, Keenan, hey, I may hate this life, but it's all I got. And you've, if you take this from me, I have, I have nothing. See? I have nothing. Yes. And so when he said that, I laughed and he was like, no, nah, man, I'm serious, bro. I'm serious. And I just said, good luck, bro. Good luck. So anyways, he got out 
uh, I ended up settling my case and stuff, caught the, you know, signed for the 16. Yeah. And he got out about a year and a half before I did. Mm. So I got out. My wife gives me a job wash, washing dishes. I'm making 50 bucks a day. Nice. I'm pissed off. I'm pissed. I'm, I, I'm making fi- I was making $50 a minute. I'm not grateful, man. I'm not grateful. I'm not grateful, man. I, I, man, people leaving, people eating food and leaving it on the plate. And I got to rake it off and wash these dishes. And man, I'm just not, man, I was very unappreciative. It didn't take me, but about, about seven days, mm. I went and got high. Got high. Went and got high. And I got high for two weeks, just off and on right there. But two weeks later, yeah. I'd been up a couple of days and I seen a gentleman walking toward me. Look familiar. Seen him from a distance. And as he was got closer, as he got closer to me, it was my buddy that was sitting on the bed, the bunk with me. It was my friend. And he looked different. He looked different. He walked it different. Matter of fact, he had a he had a glow about him, bro. He had a glow about him. Mm-hmm. And when he walked up, and I'm going to say his name, but I was like, Johnny Mac. He was like, yeah. He said, I told you, brother. Mm. He said, I told you I was going to change. And I said, man, you didn't have to say a word, man. I could see it all over you. I can see it. I was like, what did you do? I was like, what'd you do? And he proceeded to tell me, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like I was saying earlier, where I'm from, you don't see change. You don't see it. I knew this man. See, and people used to come into our cells, preachers and, you know, all the mother folks and stuff, man, and talk about change and stuff. And it would be encouraging, right? I would be encouraged by that. But I was more than encouraged when I seen him because I knew him. He'd been through that. He was cut from the same cloth. He'd been through that same thing, man, in the mud, in the mud. And I was inspired. Yeah. Inspired to me means I was, it means it moved me. It moved me. It moved me enough that a seed was planted that day, right? So I didn't see him, but here's something that happened. He went to my wife's work, got her phone number, and kept tabs on me. To keep tab, to keep tabs on me, not to ask how well I'm doing, but how bad has it gotten? Mm. And two weeks later, bro, two weeks later, man, yeah. yeah, two weeks later, my wife called him and said, "It's almost over." I was about to head back to the same place that I had just left, and it had only been a month, Keenan. It had only been a month. Mm. I've been up five days. I was laying here in my bed, yeah. laying in the bed. My wife was already gone to work. Yeah, yeah. And I'd done something that I'd never done in my life. I tried everything, right? Tried yeah. everything. But I did something that I'd never done in my whole life as I was sitting there staring at that ceiling fan trying to go to bed. I said, God help me. God help me. Man, it's the most sincere prayer that I've ever prayed because I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. I can't make this up, man. Five minutes later, five minutes later, there was a knock on my window, the back of my house, where my bedroom's at. And it was my buddy, Johnny Mag. Wow. He said, Smitty, come to the front door, brother. Come to the front door. I go to the front door, man. And I open that door and we look at each other. And he said, man, I came just in time, didn't I? I said, you sure did, brother. I need help. Wow. Here's the thing. He said, as he was headed to work, God spoke to him to come over here to check on me. 
Mm. That's as I was praying that prayer. But anyways, here's the thing. Now, let me move. That's where it began, right? That's mm -hmm. where hope began for me. So we made some phone calls and stuff, and I ended up getting off to that treatment center. Now, the mm -hmm. treatment center was four months long. Mind you, this is my seventh treatment center. I know how to move and navigate within, st within structured institutions, right? You tell me what to do, and I'm going to ace it. I can't live myself out here. I don't know left to my own. I don't know how to move. You know what I'm saying? And be responsible. But if you give me responsibility, mm -hmm. I'm going to ace it. Ace it. A plus. A plus within a structured setting because I can't structure it myself. Four months. So anyway, two and a half months in, mm -hmm. and I'm two and a half months in, we, I had another divine intervention if you will wow. okay to where i hit my knees and i accepted christ into my life and this is just me okay it's wow. my story so what i did right after that i got up and i went to the executive director mm -hmm. and i said i said brother mike man i said i know this is a four-month program but i got a lot of work to do and four months ain't gonna cut it. I need to stay here. I need to stay here longer than four months. He said, Chris, stay as long as you like. I ended up staying at that treatment center for two years, Keenan. Wow. I stayed two years, man. And here's the thing. I cut my wife off. I cut my kids off. I cut my mama off. I needed total focus. I needed total focus. Here's the thing. I've been sacrificing the ones closest to me for mm -hmm. something for something negative, for something detrimental, for something destructive, drugs, for those drugs, for that lifestyle. I've been sacrificing them, but this time I was going to sacrifice them for something good. Wow. That if something happened and they left by chance, I would still be able to stand on my own. Powerful. Two years, Kenan, I stayed at that place, man. I stayed at that place. I ended up getting a job at that place. I ended up, I ended up going to college at that place and getting my, uh, at starting on my social work degree. You know what I mean? I ended, I ended up, and here's, but here's the thing. When I made that decision, this is what I had. This is what happened since we got on here next level living. I sat mm -hmm. in my room and I said, man, I want to go to the next level. I'm tired of le I'm tired of this right here. I want to go to the next level. So what did I do? I said, what do I need to do right now? I had a whiteboard in my in my room and I started thinking about every area of my life, every facet of it, everything that extended from me. And I wrote it down and I come up with 12 life areas and I asked myself, am I fit or am I unfit in these areas? God, show me. Mm. <laughs> and every area was in shambles. Every piece of my life was in shambles, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was unfit. And I said, God, what can I do right now? Mm -hmm right now mm -hmm. to start, start getting my life fit. And the response was run, mm. run, run, Ooh, physically, physically run. Cause here's what happened. Cause when I got off the drugs, I was still miserable. What they do with them rehabs, man, they stuff you full of bread, donuts, cookies, four or five Sweet. meals, snacks, man. Socks, yeah. And yeah, and caffeine, cigarettes, caffeine, and food, man. They fill you up at them treatment centers. You know what I mean? All you can have, all you can eat, all you can stand. And I and I was still miserable. I was still unhealthy. I was still unfit. I was just going through the motions. So when I did that, and his response was run. I put my shoes on and I had to be good at running. You know why? Because I had ran from every responsibility in my life. I had to be a good runner. Ooh. Had to be, Keenan. Had Powerful. to be, bro. Yeah. So, so listen, I laced up, man. I laced up and I was out of shape. I was out of shape, bro. Mm. And I ran a quarter mile. I ran a quarter mile. That's all I had. My shins hurt. The bottom of my feet hurt. When I got back, 
man, I never, I laid in that bed, man. I did not want to get out of it. And then, and then that next morning, five o'clock came, boom, yeah. woke up. You know what I heard? Yeah. Run. Run. Woo. Run. Yeah. Run. Man, yeah. my skin still hurt. The bottom of my feet still hurt. Ooh. The bottom of my feet still hurt. And I was like, <sighs> and it was bolder. It was bolder. It was more, it was more forceful. Run, mm. run. So man, what I do, I put my shoes on in pain, aching, walked out that door at 530, mm. hit that track. And I started running again in pain. But as I was running, I was getting closer to that quarter mile again. And I was almost because I was just going to run a quarter mile again. You know what I mean? And I could see it, though. I could see me coming up on it, even in pain. But I was making progress. And I realized that progress is painful. Mm. Progress is painful, bro. Mm. I was going to have to I was going to have to not just keep running through the pain physically. I was going to have to walk and run through the pain spiritually, mentally and emotionally mm. of my past. All the wreckage of it. I was going to have to deal with it. And I knew it was going to be painful, but that was the only way that I was going to make progress in my life. Mm. And I had to be ready and prepared for it. Three months later, man, I'm up to five miles. Five running. Ooh, ooh. Running five miles. Progress. Listen, all I'm saying, look, hey, in April, I'm running 13. Progress. In April, I'm running a half a marathon. But look. Wow. But look. But you know what that did for me? That gave me energy. That gave me motivation intrinsically. People say, right. man, forget motivation. No, I was motivated by something inwardly. Something deep, something soulful, something impactful and powerful that I could not explain from here. It was here, inside. inside. I was motivated from the inside. I had more energy. I was sleeping better. I made be I made healthier eating choices. I put the cigarettes away. I could concentrate. My retention level went up. My self-esteem mm. picked up. I started being more socially acceptable of other individuals and opening up and sharing. Next thing I know, I'm, I'm an example and I'm a role model at this place. And I start working there. Wow, wow. I start working there. Two years later, trajectory of my life going up like this, right? I'm about to finish college up there and I'm making plans to stay there. Listen, I'm making plans to stay there. And here's what God yeah. said. God said out of nowhere, bro, yeah, it's, yeah. Time, it's time to go. It's time to go. It's time to go. Wow. Like, where are we going, God? Home. Wow. We're going home. After two years. After two years, but man, listen, Keenan, yeah, yeah. man, my brother, look, I did not want to go. Wow. I didn't want to go. I said, God, I've been obedient. I've done everything that you've required, everything that you've asked of me. I have done. I've been of service. I've been an example. I've let my light so shine. Right. Mm -hmm. I've done all this, man. You know, mm -hmm. I'm holding it down here. I'm holding it down. I got my lights like my life is together here. Mm -hmm. I am not. I said, I am not yeah. going to be obedient here. I'm not yeah. going home. I'm not. I'm not going home, man. I said, that's where all my pains at. That's where all my hurts at. That's where all my anger's at. The people ain't going to give me a fair shake there. I'm not. I hate that place. And the people hate me. And his response was, that's exactly why you got to go back. Ooh. Before you can move, before you can go any further. Yeah. You've got to go back and face this. You gotta face it. See, and so after about a month, four or five yeah. weeks of wrestling, with him on this, I surrendered to it and I moved home. And so I won't ever forget it. I was just telling somebody yesterday this, that when I got home, I was standing on the sidewalk close to downtown and I looked up in the sky and I just put my hands up in the air and I was like, all right, God, I said, I'm here. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And his response was the same thing. See, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. 
I gave myself time in the safety net of that facility without any distraction to really work on myself and build myself up and prepare myself for the rejections, Ooh. for the no's, for the setbacks Ooh. and for the discouragements. Wow. I did. I did because I knew, I knew they were coming. You knew, you knew. I knew they were coming. And the side eye and the whispers and the doubters and the naysayers. I gave my time so I wouldn't be angry. And, and instead of being angry, understood them, even mm. if they didn't know how to give compassion for people that had messed mm. up their life. Maybe they haven't really seen somebody change their life from from that place. And mm. I needed to be the one. That's powerful. So here's what I did. I got back there and I worked my tail off. I got me a job. I worked, I worked my tail off to get the job. Yeah, I started uncovering resources that would assist me, resources that they don't put out there for individuals that have been justice in, uh, justice involved or returning citizens or individuals or individuals with addictions or mental health disorders. They don't they don't advertise that. You know why they don't advertise that? Because those agencies are inundated and they would be overwhelmed. They would well, be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I uncovered all those resources. So you did the work. You put the work in. Yeah, I put the work in, man. Wow. Wow. I put the work in. Mm. So yeah. quick question, Mr. Yeah. Chris. So you just explained so many things that a lot of people would definitely would stay in the shadows about. You know, mm -hmm. you admitted to your addiction. You admitted to the things that you were going through, all the challenges, all the downs and the pitfalls mm -hmm. that you fell in. But however... You found out and came to your senses and said to yourself, hey, I need help. Mm -hmm. I need help. Mm -hmm. you went into a recovery house. Mm -hmm. Here it was supposed to be a four-month situation, but it turned into two years. Mm -hmm. But here it was, you applied yourself mm -hmm. due to the seeds that were planted in you, due to the past you know, letdowns and the things in, of your environment. You know, you decided that you did not want to be a product of your environment anymore. Mm -hmm. And the only time you were going to return to your environment was through change within Fact. yourself. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And then on top of that, you didn't go back judging mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. You didn't go back pointing the fingers mm -hmm. at people that are in the situation that you once were in. Mm -hmm. Instead, you went back being the change you wanted to see in the environment that you was in prior to you changing your life. Mm -hmm. That's very profound because you just shed a lot of light, especially when it comes to addiction, when it comes to being surrounded by the negative influences. That's such a common trait that goes on in the world today. And the light that you shared with people Mm -hmm. It is it, definitely, I, I know for a fact, there's people watching right now that it, it, that it definitely hit home. It mm -hmm. definitely encouraged them. It mm -hmm. definitely inspired them mm -hmm. to say, hey, if he can do it, I could do it as well. Fact. And as you just said, you just mentioned, I put in the work. I had mm -hmm. to put in the work. Some of this stuff wasn't advertised. You had to dig for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had to dig for it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean, and you and you and you and you regain the posture, not just from your own will, but you got in touch with your spirituality. Facts. You got in touch with your creator. Your creator came into your life and changed things. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people I share a lot of times about um, concerning, like with the eight domains, like spirituality is a huge part mm -hmm. of the eight domains mm -hmm. of life of the whole person. You know, mm -hmm. and and I didn't mean to cut you off, but I want you to continue because no. yeah. I know you said, you know, with that two year mark, you took two mm -hmm. years, but then you decided you wanted to be obedient. Mm -hmm. Obedience is better than sacrifice. No matter what, if you would have stayed there and you, you would have said, that, I'm not going here. No, obedience mm -hmm. is better than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And we know where we can find that at. And that's yeah. just period. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's just, you know, 
You know, you'll find yourself in, in the belly of a well somewhere, you know, living <laughs> somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? So, so again, you, you know, you know where I'm coming from now. Mm -hmm. So, but my thing is, I'm I, I'm just inspired by the change, especially when you got into like the physicality part when you mm -hmm. talk about getting in shape and things like that. Like I say it's inspiring me because yeah. here it is. Me personally, I was, you know, doing I'm, I was doing the right thing out here. I, I'm making change. Mm -hmm. um, once when I had stopped working a few years ago, here it was, you know, getting into different spaces like entrepreneurship and things like that. It allows you to chill a lot more. Mm -hmm. So here go the weights start gaining up on me. Mm -hmm. Without me knowing, not being as active as I was in prison, playing basketball and doing this and doing mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. playing every sport. So now mm -hmm. I'm like, all right. Like, that's what I probably need. Sometimes you got to encourage yourself and be sensitive to the voice mm -hmm. in whom you rely in. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So, so it's 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 very powerful. But I want you to continue. You said after that two years, you went yeah. back in past judgment. You met the people where they were mm -hmm. at, and, and you decided to make an impact mm -hmm. leading up to what you're doing now. So I want you yeah. to continue, please. I'm sorry about that. No, you're good, man. You touched on something though, really, uh -huh. Keenan, right there. See, because I wasn't just a drug addict. No. Man, I was a bro. I was addicted to everything. Man, I was addicted to everything. Man, I look, and I knew that just because the drugs were out of the way doesn't mean that I still had didn't have other disorders or dysfunctions in my life that needed dealt with. Because if I didn't deal with them, it would only lead me back to those drugs. That's it. You know, I had a I had a porn addiction. I had a drug addiction. I had, like I said, a, a mental health disorder. I had a food addiction. I would always eat. I would eat till I was uncomfortably full. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would eat till I was uncomfortably full. And, you know, lazy, you know, and uh -huh. I had a sex addiction. I had, a, I mean, you name it. Let's just go down. The, look, I used to bite my nails until they bleed. If I'd done anything, I would do it all the way. So I made a decision. I was like, man, look, I can still be addicted, but let's, let's be addicted to the climb. Let's be addicted to that next level, that next level living, right? Like the title says, let's do that. Because if I am, if I do have an addictive personality, addictive traits, then let's turn those negatives into a viable resource that we can utilize to improve our life. So that's where I got my uh, or my fit for recovery motto, go all in to get it all out because it's 100%. It's always going to be 100%. So what was I wanting to change? I was wanting to change everything. I wanted to change all of it. Every bit of, if I'm going to work on my life, I'm going to work on every facet of it, facet of it, every piece of it. I was going to improve and improve and improve and improve next level living. That's what I wanted. And so I was like, man, so here we go. That's what I went on. And I knew. So here's what I did, Keenan. Here's what I did. What you do? Before I went back home. Right before I went back home. Okay. Okay. What you do? You know how they say, you know, in the recovery rooms, before you get ready to use, roll the tape through, like play the tape through yeah, yeah, about what that looks like. Okay. Right. Right. But I decided if I was going to have a great life, not a good life, no, a great life, a fantastic life picture, like, let me picture this life almost beyond my imagination of what I want my life to look like. Right. I rolled the tape through, but I didn't I didn't dismiss or skip that middle part and get to the end. No, I seen myself at the end, but I wanted to rewind that from the end. And I wanted to get into the middle, the meat of the journey of that. And you know what that looked like? That looked like suffering. That looked like discouragement. That looked like that looked like being tired. That looked like that looked like some rejections. That looked like some mistakes. That looked like almost giving up. 
that looked like that looked like just a bunch of mess, uh, a, a whole bunch of me being distraught. Right. I needed to see that. But I need to I needed to see me working through that, all that to get to where I wanted to go. And then I said, man, you know what? Sign me up. Sign me up. Because if I ain't dead yet, if I survived all that I've been through, been shot in the back, wow. suicide, like I said, shot in the back, suicidal ideation, bar fights, got a, got the got the memorabilia on my arms. Wow. I'm just saying overdoses. Like if I survived all this stuff right here, yeah. and this right here, this right here, here, man, I know what hard looks like. I know what hard looks like. So, man, sign me up for that hard stuff, man. Mm. Sign me up for that hard stuff. Sign me up. And that's where I'm at right now in the middle of it. So I so I went back. I played the tape in the meat of what that journey looks like. And I knew it was going to be hard. You're right. I, you're right. I don't have to do a thing. I don't have to do it when the conditions ain't right. Mm. Right. But I choose to because all the conditions aren't going to fit into the life that I want to easily walk through. No, I know it's going to be difficult. I know it's going to be tough. And I know sometimes it's going to be lonely. Nobody else is going to be around. But what are you doing when nobody else is around, right? So mm. I'm going to keep on working. That's what I'm going to do. So I got back. So I got back home. And I started putting the work in. The same police officers that arrested me. <coughs> excuse me. The same police officers that arrested me introduced me to a drug prevention coalition that we had in our area. I started going to those meetings, volunteering where I could, asking churches and rotary clubs and American legions if I could come and talk, asked if I could go to the school and speak. I even asked if I could go into the jail. They thought about it for three months, but then I got a then I got a recommendation from the drug investigator and they said, yeah, come on in. While wow. I still had that, while I'm on the 16 year sentence, right? Started sharing. And you know what they said when I went into the jail, Keenan? When, when I seen the guys, when I seen the guys, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. they said, man, hope just walked through the door, bro. <laughs> hope just walked. And I knew, man, listen, wow. I knew that this is why he, see, sometimes we can't see. We make our own plans, but but he determines our steps, right? And so and we got to be obedient to the step because he knows where he's leading us and for what reason? Because he sees, look, he sees the ending at the beginning. <laughs> All right. And he said, this is going to make sense. I know it doesn't make sense right now, but it's going to make sense. And you're going to have that aha moment. It's going to make you trust me even more. There you go. Gonna, so I walked through there, man. They let me stay for hours, bro. Five, six hours. I'd be in there playing spades with them. Wow. You know, yeah, running, yeah, running them next, you know, but anyway, but I got to bring a message of hope. And oh. then I got to go to the next jail and then the next jail, then the next jail. And oh, somebody mm-hmm. and somebody happened to somebody from the state happened to be at a community forum at a at a university, college university that I was speaking at. Wow. And after I got done speaking, he came up and he was like, man, he introduced himself and he was like, hey, here's my card, man man, you're incredible, man. Let's get together. Give me a call. I said, absolutely. So I called him. He worked for the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. I started helping individuals in my area that he would get calls from. Um, and I would go speak to them that if they were struggling with a substance use or mental health disorder, and he would call me and I would go speak to him. Well, anyways, he took a promotion He took a promotion within the department and the director, shout out Dr. Monty Burks, man. Shout out Dr. Monty Monty Burks. Okay, Monty Burks. Yeah, shout out Mm -hmm. Dr. Monty Burks. Inspirational dude, man. He'll be at the reentry conference speaking, guys, you know, in April. Be there. Be there. Yeah, so anyways, um, he asked, he asked, uh, he asked that fella, he was like, you got anybody in mind? And he said, I know just a person. And so I took a job. I ended up getting the job as a peer project coordinator where I overseen, yeah, where I overseen building up recovery capital in 10 counties. 
wow. in the north in, in the northwestern region of my state. Right. Wow. Oh, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And we increased it. I brought in two treatment centers. Uh, yeah, we got two treatment centers established, three recovery boards. We we implemented and sustained three three reentry programs. You know, all volunteers from the community. The churches were giving us buildings to do IOP. You know, uh, it's incredible. Mm. It's incredible, and we built it up, and we got to build it up, create recovery capital for individuals that were returning back in their community from either treatment. Mm -hmm. or incarceration mm -hmm. wow. and so what 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 we did everything that i did when i got back home uncovering mm -hmm. those resources right mm -hmm. helped to streamline that process for those individuals returning because what do we do when we get mm -hmm. out we look around and say what's next all what's right next? what do we do now what do we and it's just and it's discouraging especially for individuals that are in rural areas where all the resources are dispersed and they operate in silos Wow, man, no. Wow. So my my job, my mission was to connect those resources for those individuals that before they got out, they would be set up and streamlined so they wouldn't be confused, discouraged or distraught. Mm. So mm. we could increase so we could increase recovery capital in our communities. And that's what I did. And one of those things and one of those other things was our recovery court. We were the last five counties in our judicial district that did not have some type of alternative court sentencing or pathway for individuals with mental health or substance use disorders. Right. Um, um, in, in our judicial in, in our state, last five counties. Well, the individual. Well, the individual that was going to run for judge because a seat came open, heard that I'd changed my life. That individual that was running for judge used to be my defense attorney. Wow. And he needed to see it for himself. So he set a meeting up. And when he seen it, he said, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Wow. And he was like, man, you've inspired me to run uh, one of my platforms where is recovery court or recovery. And he said, if I get it, what do you think? Can we start working on recovery? I said, absolutely, brother. Absolutely. So Governor Lee, the governor of our great state of Tennessee, appointed him judge. And we got together and he said, you ready to run it? I said, yeah. He offered mm -hmm. me the job. Make a long story short. Man, I took the job. Now I'm program now I'm program director wow. of our 24 judicial district recovery court, and we just started this. Uh, we I started in July, but we got it up and running in October. Here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. Yeah. We're in the midst of creating a health foundation in our community that wow. we can operate or run grants through to continue to create recovery capital. Our county is also in the process of giving us land, giving us land to bring a treatment center in. It takes time, Kenan. It takes time. Too. I all the time. It takes time. Yes. Yes. And everything, like everything, everything takes time. You just, you've just got to continue whatever it is. I don't care what it is. I don't yeah. care if it's losing weight or yeah. getting in shape. It takes time. I don't care if you're going back to school to get a degree. It yeah. takes time. I don't care if you're climbing up the, uh, the, the, the ladder in your company. It takes time. Yeah. I don't care if you want to save 150000 dollars it takes time i don't care if you're starting a new business it takes time you know everything takes time do not uh -huh. do not abandon the mission do not you're going to have bumps you're going to have nose you're going to again you you're going to uh, your mental health is going to be up and down you yes. you're going to be angry you know you're going to be excited you're going to be all these things all these things are going to happen and it's just part of the process of whatever it is that the whatever the vision was that was given to you i say it all the time the vision never would have been given to you if you could not fulfill it wow you just got to stay the course. You, 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 you stay the course. 
You've been, you been you burning it down, man. You've been giving that fire out, man. I'm telling you, hey, you begin to preach. I know we're coming down on the hour. Man. I do not want me no weeds to, to cut you off or anything. Man. No, we're good. You've we're been, good. You've been, you've been terrific, man. People are here. I want to shout out some of these people, man, that's in the, in the chat. You got Brother Rick Diaz, man. He said, yes, he's a preacher himself. Um, mm -hmm. We got a lot of people. We got Brother Jamal. He came in to show his support. My Jesus. man. Yeah, he said, man, your testimony was powerful. We had the Brother Bayak here. Uh, he locked in uh, Miss Jackie. Miss Jackie, peace to you. Thank you so much. Miss She's always a great support. You already know her. Dr. James Baker, positive influence, man. Mm -hmm. He watched you from over here in Jersey. Oh, man. Be on the lookout, man. Uh-oh. Uh, it's powerful. Uh, Cousin mm -hmm. uh, Michelle, appreciate you. Uh, Mr. Mitch, uh, Richard Miles, appreciate you as well. Miss um, Amber Williams, uh, thank you so much. To Amber. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, we got uh changing lives here. I know it takes up the whole screen, but we can definitely read it in the comments later. Um, yeah, all the support, man. Everybody, the ones even didn't comment. We appreciate everybody tuning in. And we're narrowing down here, you know, to the last like five minutes. We're definitely going in like at the top of the hour. Um, so um, Mr. Mr. Chris, um, if you can go ahead and mm -hmm. encourage the people. Um mm -hmm. The ones that are listening, the ones that uh, may be in a halfway house, they may be in a recovery house, mm -hmm. individuals that may be in a prison right now, mm -hmm. you know, that word, I'm quite sure they heard your story and it just mm -hmm. blown mm -hmm. them away. But if you can encourage them um, in, in, in sort of a, a takeaway, and also um, if you could just let them know how to contact you if need be, because I know that you are. On, on, on spot guy, like, hey, look, I can talk right now. You, you, you <laughs> call him or email him. Hey, let's yeah, go. Yeah. But you're always willing, and just <laughs> best believe you will be blessed for having the heart that you have, man. Because not yeah. many people have that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some people will blow you off. They get mm -hmm. so arrogant. Oh, I ain't got time for this. I ain't got time for that. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, I, I really may need help. Yeah. I may be suffering mentally. I may be suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, physically. I may be suffering spiritually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I might just need that encouraging word that'll get me through my day. You know what I mean? And a lot of times Absolutely. we overlook individuals that have that type of heart. And oftentimes mm -hmm. those type of individuals are taken for granted, you know, mm -hmm. and not given the certain credit or the props, you know, that they deserve. But instead, mm -hmm. a lot of these people that are in the high places, and, you know, oh, I'm up on this place, this pedal stool, as if mm -hmm. you don't know, you forgot where you came from. Ooh, come on. You know what I'm saying? Come on, and, and, and that's what and that's what happens, you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. We got the last three minutes now. But yeah, if you could yeah. just encourage them and you can just go ahead and take us out with how they can contact you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know right. Keita. I, I know I, I I know when I dropped my phone number uh to you, you was like, dang. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Listen, I dropped my number, man. Look, I don't care. And when yeah. I tell you I'm gonna call you or to call yeah, me, yeah, yeah. You call. I'm I mean it. I mean it. Yeah, I mean it. Phone number, 731-393-3437. Wow. wow, you dropped it right there. Right there. If you need to call somebody, if you need to talk, I'm going to pick up. If I don't pick up, I'm going to call right back. Email cdsmith0720 at gmail.com. We'll be hopefully, um, and you can catch me on LinkedIn. Hopefully, uh, I don't know if it'll be this year. Um, I'm not, we're not in the process. We're about to begin the process of the website. Um, hopefully it may be at the end of this year, uh, start of, start of next year. But guys, I'm going to tell you, I've been in the, I've been, <clears throat> I've been in that place where you try and you try and you try and you don't think it's ever going to get any better. You don't know. You don't, you, sometimes you don't even know why you continue to do it because you're not seeing those results or you're not, <clears throat> or, or you're not having the outcome, that particular outcome that you'd like to have. Mm -hmm. And you're not sure if you can really make something of yourself. I'm here to tell you, you can. Mm -hmm. You can again. And if you stay the course, you will. You're destined to do good things. Mm -hmm. 
and your past has nothing to do with the good things that you're destined to do. All the hurt, all the pain, all the anguish, all the trials and tribulations that you've you've been in and you're still here are only treasures and nuggets for the things that you're going to have to deal with to get to where you're going. But remember, you're going to make it. Reach out if you need me. Love you guys, man. Yes, and without further ado, we appreciate Mr. Chris coming on with the Next Level Living, the Re-Entry Connect podcast. I'm your host, Keenan Hudson. And without further ado, Mr. Chris, we're going to thank you once again. And yeah. uh, we're going to get ready to end this show. But we appreciate everybody for tuning in. But until next time, Mr. Chris, you have a good night. Be we blessed, salute. guys. Everybody